Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming today. Um, as Sergio just mentioned, the title of my talk is Feminist and Queer Legal Theory Toward Family Abolition. Um, so uh, I thought I would start with this painting by a Polish artist. I think it's really interesting and apt for our discussion today because it's sort of like a domestic scene, but it's all kind of topsy-turvy. So I want to sort of keep that kind of that energy going forward through the slides. All right. Um, so let's just go get right into it. Um, so this is a little bit of a, a preview of what I think we're going to discuss today. Um, so first of all, we'll go through a little bit of what I mean when I say feminist legal theory, queer legal theory, family abolition, and sort of I'll give you a better, that'll give you a better sense of how I'm using those words um, or those terms. And then also a little bit about the family as a legal institution. Um, unfortunately, I am a legal theorist, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to make this as sort of as understandable and kind of outside of the deep kind of bog of legal theory as possible today. Um, and then we're going to go into a little case study of family work and welfare in Ontario. Um, and then uh, try and circle back to some of the stuff we talked uh, we talk about after that um, to feminist and queer legal theory and applying a materialist um, lens to those legal theories and then some conclusions to finish this off. Um, so this is my little primer that I prepared today. I'm going to talk a little bit about yeah what all these words mean. Um, but first I wanted to sort of ground a presentation in, in an idea of or in an understanding of what we need to live our lives, right? So I think we, we in family law specifically, we talk a lot about relationships, but I think the starting point is actually much more, it's much sort of more prior and much deeper and more kind of basic, um, which is the, the things that we need to live our lives. And so these needs could be uh, very general, like we all need food to eat, we all need somewhere to live, um, but they can also be very particular to our particular kinds of kind of life. So this might be like glasses to see if you have bad eyesight like me, uh, it could be a wheelchair to get around, a crib for a baby that you're taking care of for whatever reason. Um, and so, yeah, these we all have needs. These are all needs that we all have. Um, and this is not sort of, this is unconscious. Um, but here it gets a little bit controversial is that I'm going to assert that in market societies like the one that we live in, uh, the attainment and the fulfillment of these needs is premised upon um, your ability to pay for them because these things are commodified. So this requires money. Usually, if you aren't sort of born into generational wealth, this means that you have to obtain this money through wage work in the formal marketplace, uh, labor market, sorry. Um, and this is the kind of, this is the background to, to, to how I'm approaching the question of, of, of family um, in this context. So I'm, so I'm sort of less you all got the sense that I'm sort of less concerned about the family as like a psychosocial, subjective, emotional thing, although that is important. Um, but I think that focus uh, misses a lot of what I'm interested in, particularly about the experiences of poor families and poor people trying to have family lives. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that and sort of the constraints on choice um, that the fact of a market society kind of imposes on people's um, choices about how to organize their lives. Um, okay, so family abolition, some of you will no doubt know, is um, supposedly one of the most controversial communist demands. It appears um, throughout a lot of communist, socialist, Marxist literature through the ages, perhaps starting in 1884 with the <coughs> um, who traced the family or, or, or traced the role of the family through um, history and then into sort of capitalism as a way to transmit wealth, as a way to divide labor into, into gender forms. Um, and then you see sort of this kind of, uh, a lot of sort of feminist um, economists, sociologists, and, and legal theorists as well take this up and say, okay, this is, uh, the family is not something that has existed through time, that is sort of perennial and unchanging, but it's actually something that is historical, that is contingent on a certain set of factors. Um, so here I'm thinking, when I think about family abolition, I'm thinking also of the, the interventions of people like Heidi Hartman, who write about Marxism and feminism, and who, who sort of argue that the dependency that is, this is maybe less true now, but, but um, in the sort of mid-20th century, the dependency that was associated with women who were kind of homemakers, not in the labor market, who didn't earn a wage for, for the work that they did in the home, um, this is a gender kind of dependency that is only made possible or only made sort of understandable 
in the market system known as capitalism. There's also sort of other debates that we can get into um, regarding social reproduction. Uh, so a lot of this literature kind of talks about, or yeah, a lot of this literature is, 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 is um, aims to connect the, the so-called so sort of private and public spheres and say actually what happens in the private sphere in the home but in other sort of non-commodified zones as well is actually sustaining and reproducing the public market. Um, and so these things are two sides of the same coin um, and we can't then relegate feminist concerns or women's concerns to a totally separate sphere. Okay, so that's a lot of information all at once. <coughs> um, and then uh, the other kind of the, the, the motivation of this talk and, and, and what I want to kind of argue today is that there is a, a proto-family abolitionism within a lot of feminist and queer legal theory, even though uh, those theorists might not have used those, they, they did not use those terms, um, but they might not have been kind of uh, as attentive as, as, as I would have liked them to be about um, the, the, the kind of logical endpoint to a lot of what, what they were arguing. Um, so feminist and queer legal theory are both sort of modes of critique that came about or that, 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 that arose in the mid 20th century in a lot of Anglophone North American law schools. Um, so there was in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 80s, there was a lot of sort of politics within law schools. Um, people were lots of, um, lots of more left leaning progressive and radical uh, law professors thought actually the way that we teach law is like totally wrong headed. Um, it's not, there isn't really like, um, liberal legality with its sort of assumptions about the individual, about, about the nature of law as sort of neutral or at least scientific, um, or these are all wrong. And so we see a sort of posture of critique adopted in the law schools and then feminists um, and, and queer people and particularly lesbians um, in, in the legal academy uh, were using this mode of critique as a way to sort of uh, further their political commitment to ending the subordination of people based on gender or sexuality or some combination of the two. Um, so I take feminist and queer legal theory here to be a, a broad, like loose constellation of different thinkers. Um, we're going to look at uh, two in particular today, um, Nancy Polakoff and uh, Catherine Frankie. But um, I, I take it to be a loose category, and I think this is generally like a thrust in um, in critical legal studies um, that that has this sort of proto abolitionist form. Um, so yes, I'm. I'm so the, so the stakes of, of all of this, you might be thinking like, okay, this is like, family abolition is, seems sort of maybe utopian, it seems far away, it seems like this imaginative project that the kind of on the ground, how much money can you get from your spouse, sort of thinking that we associate with family law doesn't really, like those two things don't really match together. Um, so I'm, the kind of, the underlying sort of uh, motivation of this talk or, or where a lot of this is to, to counter um, a prevailing and sort of more increasingly kind of persuasive, I think, um, for other people, uh, discourse within family law theory um, in recent, in the post same sex marriage era uh, that talks about choice as like the founding and the foundational uh, sort of concept and justification for all regulation of family life. So, the, so this argument that's made by people like uh, Palazzo, Aloni, a couple other sort of um, big players in this, Nicholas Bala, who's the Queens, also talks about this. But um, yes, the, the argument runs like this. So um, family life um, is about honoring people's choices. We all have different preferences and choices about who we want to be in a relationship with, who we want to have children with, who we want to live with. Um, and this is the grounding thing that, grounds, that, that, that sort of underlies all regulation. The only, the only reason the state can intervene in, in family life, um, which is sort of ring fence, is through people's choice. And that, that choi the choice that is usually exercised um, is the choice to marry. And now this is all sort of, this, this feels fine. Of course, we don't want to force people into getting married to, to someone they don't want to be married to, and that's, that's a crime. Um, but it, but it's, it's a little bit simplistic. Like, I think there's a lot of ways that choice does not structure at all. Or, or sorry, the, the, the choice is, um, it's unable, or people are unable to exercise choices in their family lives. And, and the, the, the main constraint that I'm concerned with here is the material one and the conditions um, that need to be present uh, in order to be able to, to make a choice about family life. So, so one sort of very important example for me um, is the, uh, is the, the, the 
the choices of social assistance users. And um, so we're going to go into this a little bit later in the talk. But one of the one of the things that is really kind of the, the complete flip side of, or I think completely kind of discredits the, the, the choice justification is that, well, if you use social assistance, um, you have to report how much income you get, and that will affect how much money you get from the social assistance um, authority or regime. Um, and if you get married to someone or start living with them, because um, in Ontario, it's if you live somewhere for three months, you're, you're, you're counted as a spouse, um, that you are taken, you are assumed uh, to be sharing that other person's money, and that will make your entitlement lower. And this is really like, um, important money for people. The sort of adequacy rates in Ontario and across Canada um, and North America more broadly, honestly, are just nowhere near what people need to rent. I mean, we all know what, what cost of living is like here to, 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 to buy food, to take care of uh, other people, um, to sort of afford wheelchairs or like special equipment or special therapy that they might need if they have a disability. And certainly not enough to live the kind of flourishing life that we want family law to be able to, or we want law or people generally to be able to, to do for themselves. Um, so that's so that's the kind of constraint on choice that I'm very concerned with here. Um, okay, so I hope that that all made sense to everyone. Uh, we're going to move on a little bit now to um, Nancy Polikoff, who is uh, is sorry, a um, an American legal theorist, and she's writing a lot about. She's very concerned with um, valuing all families, is her approach. Um, and she would, and, and so she, she says that family law, as it exists, as it, as it exists, excuse me, now, um, values really only one kind of relationship, which is the sexual conjugal one. And here she has, has in mind marriage. Um, and she's she's writing in a long tradition of gay and lesbian and queer activists who are very opposed to same-sex marriage on sort of from a progressive um, from from the left. Right, so um, they reject heteronormativity. They reject also the idea that marriage is a boundary uh, within which, so married people have more um, privileges and rights than people who are unmarried, and this is like an untenable situation for people like Polakoff. Um, so Polakoff says, and I'm going to just briefly read this out: um, the care required of inevitable dependents is a biological necessity, and those who provide such care have a legitimate claim to the collective resources of society. Beyond that, as members of society, all individuals need access to food, housing, and healthcare. One's attachment to another adult in an intimate sexual relationship should not be the basis for apportioning these basic necessities. An ailing mother, an unemployed dear friend, a brother or a sister, or an informally adopted kin, here she's referring to chosen kin and families of choice, all should be acceptable choices for the conferral of benefits now linked to the status of sexual partner. Um, so this is sort of, this is still very, very true in the American context where there's quite a, a steep drop off between marriage and non-marriage. So um, if you're married, you get lots of things. And if you're not married, they don't recognize unmarried cohabitants. That's less true um, in provinces in Canada like Ontario, which are pretty liberal with recognizing cohabitants, although there, there's some things that you're still shut out from. So Polakoff's argument follows on from a longer line of kind of feminist ethics and ethics of care um, thinking that that says that the sex part isn't really actually very important. Um, what is good and what what justifies marriage's sort of existence or, or justifies the, the the benefits and responsibilities and rights that come with marriage is actually the care that we provide to someone to another in in this relation. Um, so she's thinking particularly about things um, like. Uh, like healthcare, which of course um, is maybe a particularity of the American context, but not 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 really. I don't think. I mean, in in the in the in the way that many people think that it's particular because the healthcare system in America is is, is awful. Um, but but she's thinking about things like disability, about children, and simply just companionship. I think I don't think you need to resort to the sort of extreme um, case of like someone who needs twenty four seven care in order to to sustain this argument that she's making. So Polakoff, following from people like Martha Feynman, is saying caring relationships should be the object of family law's regulatory function. So family law shouldn't regulate like who you have sex with or who you're in love with or who you have romantic feelings to, um, but it should it should regulate and therefore disperse resources um, based on who who cares. And Polakoff here, um, as you can see, is also very concerned with the in-group out-group problem of beneficiaries, right? Um, so even though so she's she's obviously sort of she's she's pro same sex marriage. She doesn't think 
um, or I mean, she's not pro same sex marriage, but but she's um, but she's concerned with a different kind of queer liberation. I think here than she is, um, than that than she is other um, other queer activists who are pro same sex marriage. Um, so here I think with Polakoff we see the beginnings of a question starting to emerge, um, which she doesn't really take very much further than this. So she talks about. So I think the question I take the question that she's asking to be who should take responsibility for care. And this is like a much broader question. And there's other areas of law, other other social policy things, especially, um, which which both which all go to this question. But she's beginning to ask the question, who should take responsibility? Um, so who should take responsibility? Um, so Catherine Frankie, who's the other person I sort of named dropped at the start of the, the talk, um, she also arrives at a similar conclusion. Um, but she, I think, brings it, she calls us to, to, to think, as people who are married or not, about the political implications of entering into something. And so I think she, she gives us, um, she gives us a sort of, the, the basis for trying to argue that this is, um, like the sort of old feminist maxim, this is political and not just personal, right? Um, and so she has eight prescriptions that she, that she, that she makes to sort of respectable queers who want to get married. Um, and there's eight, I'm not gonna go through all eight, but six, seven, and eight I think are really interesting. And I'll read them out very briefly for you. Resist, so number six, resist making arguments in support of marriage rights that rest on a negative judgment toward paying taxes. Um, seven, calculate the tax benefits you receive from being married, including estate taxes, and give the money away to a worthy cause. And finally, eight, think about what it means to gain an economic advantage through marriage, passing money tax-free to preferred relatives, such as spouses, rather than to the broader kin network so prevalent in the lesbian and gay community. So again, we see this sort of in-group, out-group thing emerging um, that, that Frankie is very interested in the personal responsibility that married queers have to their unmarried brethren. Um, and I think when we read Frankie like this, I think it's important to keep in mind a lot of recent feminist scholarship outside of the legal theory field about how, um, about this sort of uneasy alliance that's, that's formed in the last 30 years between a neoliberal economic ideology that would uh, transfer responsibility for these publics, for, for goods that were once public um, to the market. And the, the, so the alliance between neoliberalism and the neoconservative familialism, which then, as you can see, if it's going back to the private, then what's going to, what's going to take responsibility? It is the family with its gendered norms um, and gendered social roles. Um, and sorry, gendered divisions of labor as well. Um, so here I'm thinking about people like Melissa Cooper, um, and then as well as uh, like, like labor people like Judy Fudge have also written about this too. Um, so yes, now I think we have to talk a little bit about the elephant in the room, which is the history of same-sex marriage and the impact that it has had on the field of, of, sort of legal theory of the family. Um, so this is a photo of Jim Egan, who is on the right there, and then his uh, partner, who would then become his husband, um, uh, Jack Nesbitt. So Egan would actually bring, end up bringing a case before the Supreme Court of Canada, arguing that the Old Age Security Act was discriminatory towards same-sex couples. He was unsuccessful in it, although sort of he was successful in the sort of smaller challenge of, of getting the Supreme Court to say that uh, discrimination based on sexuality was discrimination under the charter. Um, so this history, I think, is very important to the way that the, the, the Polakoffian and Frankie arguments kind of proceed. Um, I think it, it tells us a lot about uh, the law as a battleground for um, queer rights and queer liberation, as well as feminism generally. Um, but I think it also, oh, I, I think it, it also kind of points to something that's neglected, neglected in a lot of um, feminist writing so far on like poverty and women's poverty in particular, um, which doesn't really, I don't think, um, talk or it doesn't critique, doesn't level critique at the family form and at, at, and at the structures that police it, namely sort of law and social assistance is the other one that I'm concerned with. I mean, in, in many ways, the family is a very legal institution in, in, in today's world. Like you need to engage with the family, obviously, to get married. Uh, sorry, you need to engage with the law to get married. Um, if you have a child, you need to register that child. If you adopt the child, you need to adopt it through the law. And so you, so the, the engagement with the law, I think, um, in order to create a family is one that is sort of akin to, and maybe this is Foucauldian, but like this is a policing kind of structure, right? Um, 
And then in the in, in another sort of really important way that law is a, a family is a legal institution is that the law creates and enforces the obligations that come from being in a legally recognized family. Um, so it all and it structures presumptively because most people don't have you don't have a choice about sort of if you're married you are subject to the, the family poverty rules upon divorce. Um, so so you're kind of conscripted into uh, the the law's idea of a family and the, the law's assumptions and presumptions about what happens within that structure. Um, yeah, so let's move on to some more feminism. Um, so this is Kathy Weeks writing about family. Family Abolition in 2021. Um, so I think here um, she's talking about the kind of the, the sort of two-faced relationship that a lot of people have with the family. So the family is at once a place of solace and comfort and kind of and, and, and love and joy and a bulwark against the, the bad things in the world, right? Um, but at the same time, it is also structured by a state that is patriarchal, that is, um, she mentions settler colonial, bourgeois, heterosexist, um, and presumptively white as well. Uh, so, so she, I think she's calling us here, and, I, and I'm kind of, I, I use this quote to sort of get to the point that, well, yeah, uh, we can have these subjective experiences of family life that are positive and good, but that is something separate from um, the history of the institution and the justifications and sort of assumptions that, that are embedded within the legal regulation of the institution of the family. Um, so here is sort of my little, little parry with the, the, the choice folks who would say family is about recognizing love um, and, and, and as sort of outward expressions of, of, of relationship with, with another. And I think that's less important than, than, than this. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about a, the case study that I teased at the start of the presentation. So. I'll explain the photo first. This is a screenshot um, of the closest Ontario Disability Support Office that I could find to the St. George campus. Um, so I wanted to kind of show this uh, because we're going to be talking about ODSP uh, shortly too. So ODSP, for those uh, who are unfamiliar, is Ontario's general uh, sorry Disability Income Support Program. So it's supposed to be a program of last resort. Um, which means that after you've exhausted everything and you have no other sort of recourse for, for supporting yourself, you go to an ODSP office and the caseworker will do this, do everything for you. Um, but it is sort of famously uh, meager in terms of its adequacy. Um, I think I think the rates that I uh, at least that I last checked were like the maximum. I think it was like thirteen hundred you could get a month, uh, which as you may know, is sort of not enough for rent even. Um, but OD being on ODSP has sort of other benefits for, for disabled people, um, including getting uh, private ODSP health insurance, which of course, if you're disabled and need medical care, um, that is extremely important. Um, so I'm raising this, or I'm, I'm showing you this photo because I, I think it's important uh, that if we wanna be serious about defending a legal theory toward family abolition, to, to center that theory um, on the experiences of very poor people, um, rather than people who have assets, who've sort of historically been the protagonists of family law theorizing. Um, so, okay. So here are excerpts from two cases. Um, I will, we'll, we'll get into the detail a little bit later. Um, but it, in order to sort of make this intelligible, um, I'll give you a brief kind of rundown of what spousal support in, in Ontario means. Um, so in Ontario, spousal support is, uh, oh, sorry, entitlement to spousal support is based on two justifications. So first is compensation, uh, which is if you, uh, the sort of the, the, the paradigmatic example is, is a woman who leaves the labor market in order to take care of children or, or do domestic work in the house. And she suffered a loss uh, during the relationship of that of sort of foregone opportunities in her, in her career. I mean, at the end of the relationship, she, she's compensated for that loss. The other head of, of sort of entitlement for spousal support is non-compensatory um, or needs-based spousal support. And this is what we're concerned with here in these two, in these two cases. And so needs-based spousal support widened the entitlement, widened rather entitlement to spousal support, just sort of uh, 
extremely. Like it blew it, it, it blew it wide open. Because if you can prove that you have a need, um, which most people can, especially if they have disabilities like um, Elaine and Constance in these two cases, uh, you can get spousal support. Now this is like a really, this is, I think, um, I think it's very often understated that this is like a huge change in the law of spousal support. So it's not so much about equality, which you'd expect with the compensation, right? Like you need to show a loss and a corresponding benefit, and then it's a transaction and you switch. But this is something totally different. This is, um, this is someone making a claim against someone else for a need that normally uh, we would say, well, tough, right? Um, and so there's, there's a lot of sympathy that the judges have for, for these claimants, and rightly so. Um, so let's go into the facts. These two cases both have very, very similar facts and decided around the same time. Um, so both Van Rijthoven, Elaine Van Rijthoven, sorry, and Constance Smith uh, were ex-wives. Um, who had sort of debilitating, who have de debilitating disabilities that mean that they cannot work. And so they were certified disabled by ODSP and they were receiving money from, from the program. Um, so this isn't talked about too much in the Van Rijthoven case, but I assume, I think that this is actually what happened as well there. But Constance Smith, who's sort of the, the lower, um, the, the second example, she was told by her ODSP caseworker to go apply for spousal support. Um, and this is because ODSP obliges its recipients to look for all available streams of income, including your ex-husband. Um, and so she went and she was like, okay, well, I don't want my ODSP to be cut off, so I'm gonna go do what my caseworker says to do. And so she gets to court. Um, she makes the argument, she is very clear that she is disabled and she has a, a strong need. Um, so courts in, in Canada use um, these advisory guidelines called the Spousal Support Advisory Guidelines. And it's a formula that you plug numbers into. And there's a couple of variables. So one is uh, the length of the relationship and then also the, dif the income differential between the two parties. So if you have a longer relationship and a bigger income differential, you are the range that the formula spits out is higher or bigger. Um, so Smith, Constance Smith went to court. The judge put all the, the numbers into the calculator um, and came up with uh, a range that had $520 at the top end of it, right? The, I think the lower one was like 300 and something. Uh, but the judge very sort of savvily was like, wait, I've read the ODSP Act. I know that if I give Constance $500 more every month, the ODSP, she's gonna have to tell the ODSP, and then the ODSP is gonna add that to her income and then take away some of the social assistance that the, they were giving her originally. And so you see this is a very sort of cynical kind of undertone to this, where the ODSP caseworker is like, maybe I can balance the fiscal budget a little bit more by getting this lady to make a claim against her ex-husband. Um, so the court's like, okay, that's 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 not that's not the point of spousal support. That's not the point of needs-based spousal support, because that's not going to address her needs. Uh, it's actually going to make her probably worse off. And so the court makes an order that is uh, far in excess. Um, I don't think, I don't have the order here, but, but it was like $1,200 a month, which is like more than double or double. Um, and it was an order indefinite in time period. So she would get $1,200 a month forever until uh, she went back to the court or until her circumstances changed. But but essentially that was forever. And that's like a very, very big difference um, that the, 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 the judge used his discretion to kind of just give up. Um, so we can be happy for Constance here. And a very similar thing happened to Elaine as well. And these, um, and so we can be happy for Elaine and Constance here. This is great. They have more money in their pockets at the end of the day. Um, but there's something that sort of rankles and irks about these judgments. Still, if you are coming from the Polakoffian and Frankie tradition, um, because you would ask, well, that's great for these two ladies, but these are judgments that actually reinforce the form of the nuclear family. So even if you've gotten a divorce, and in Van Rijthoven's case, it was 12 years since the divorce, you can always come back and get more money from your former spouse. Like it's totally, that goes totally against a lot of other justifications for marriage, which includes for clean, or sorry, divorce, which include clean breaks and the idea that like, well, in modern times, relationships end and you move on and that's good. And you know, there, that, that kind of, but this is completely sort of making a zombie of the, new, of the family or the relationship in this case. Um, and I think we can only really understand, or I think the argument that we need to make about these cases is that the court is using this sort of familialism, not, I don't think, because it has a normative commitment to familialism, 
But I think because um, it's using it as it's using it as sort of a very practical stopgap for a very miserly and ungenerous social assistance system, which these two ladies were relying on. And this isn't very satisfying, or this is actually very unsatisfying. Um, and, and we see again here like the absence of choice for both Elaine and Constance. Um, they don't want to be married to their former husbands anymore, but then they have this legal relationship with them where the money that they have in their pocket at the end of the month is extremely, is sort of tied to whether or not their ex-husband is going to pay, and they don't pay sometimes, right? Um, and this her Polikov is making the legal relationship even more important for securing the basic necessities of life. Um, and there's also, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is that there is a contingency here that is really also unsatisfying if you're concerned about meeting people's needs. So Elaine and Constance would only be able to meet their needs or, or were only able to meet their needs because they had a husband who did sort of pretty well for himself during and after the relationship. But a lot of people are not in that situation. Um, and so I follow um, Michelle Barrett and Mary McIntosh here when they say that we can be happy for Elaine and Constance, but this is actually bad for, 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 the, for people who have a commitment to dismantling the larger structure of patriarchy or ableism in society, right? And, and people who are sort of committed to resisting the commodification of, of life in this way. Um, so I think, so, so here I think these two cases, are, they're, they're interesting and kind of sad, um, but I think we need a much more nuanced argument about them than just thank, thank you, judge, for being flexible and exercising your discretion, which is a lot of what we see. Um, so how does this all connect to family abolition? Um, yeah, these cases are not abolitionists at all. And, and we, can, we can kind of actually sort of, I think, argue that they are completely the opposite, that they're very familiarist cases. Um, and so if, if, we, if this is sort of the structure of family law, um, I think the, the, the next question that sort of arises is like, what is family law for, if not first, first for uh, respected choices? Because uh, Elaine and Constance, their choice about romantic partner was not really respected, or they had to weigh that choice against the choices of, do I have enough money? Um, and so I think if we understand family law as having a distributive question at its heart, right? It's not about uh, psychosocial subjective kind of relationality, but it's about uh, money and resources and time um, and work. Um, then I think we can pay attention to, I think this allows us to pay more attention to the situation of people like Elaine and Constance who are really caught between a rock and a hard place. Um, so before we sort of move on to the rest of it, this is, this is I think, a really interesting painting to look at in this juncture. This is, um, it's called uh, Seeds of Housekeeping for Women Working. And so I'm not going to try and argue that Edo period Japan was like a communist utopia that had no family. So that's that's false. Um, but but the, the sort of simpler point is that, um, yeah, the, the way that we all live currently in these sort of single family households is really historically contingent. I um, mean, there's nothing natural about it. It certainly might be our preferences, but it's also not. Yeah, it's not inevitable. Um, and I think if we keep this in mind as we think about um, the distributive question that I think is at the heart of family law, I think I think um, I think we can sort of we can understand why, or, or we can begin to come to an answer as to why family law in Canada is structured around a particular nuclear relationship. And I think then we understand then then it's easier to understand the politics that underlie family law and its regulation of life. Um, and these might, and these would be sort of familialism, a gender ideology that focuses on um, strict gender roles and a separation and, and a categorization of certain kinds of labor as feminine and masculine. But then also um, on a sort of more macro political econo uh, economy sort of scale, um, discourses about deservingness and responsibility. So who takes responsibility, who pays for things, uh, who does things, um, and who is deserving of having our needs met, right? Um, and in, in, in this, in Elaine Smith and uh, sorry, Elaine Van Brighthoven and Constance Smith were judged to be quite deserving, um, but they, but but that was, uh, but that's not sort of the case for everybody, um, and we don't want to, I think, premise the fulfillment of needs on uh, a court or a judge rather saying that someone is deserving of, of extra support. 
Um, so I think, uh, so, so, so that's, that's that. Um, and, I, and I posit really that in order to do this kind of theory that lays bare the politics of family law, um, we have to pay much more attention to material conditions and the, and the preconditions of family life. Um, and and, uh, and if we're sort of allocating responsibility for, for care as opposed to sex, um, then I think feminist and queer legal theorists need to be much more kind of, um, yeah, incisive about critiquing the justifications that underlie family law. And this is, is and it's not just sort of the surface that Elaine and Constance have more money in their pockets. Um, and so, I, so this is what I think is the, the, the proto-family abolitionist impulse in a lot of Holocaust and Frankie, that it's not about sex, that it's about care. But, but in order to kind of make it um, a really sort of abolitionist theory, I think we need to move a little bit further. <coughs> and, then we, and we say, okay, we have care, that seems good, but does that really take us all the way there, right? Um, and I don't think it does. Um, so if we're thinking about care, where does that leave us as like legal theorists of the family? Um, so I think uh, this is, yeah, so I think that's kind of, I'm always very skeptical rather of, of people who kind of lionize the, the, the place of care and the importance of care. Um, like I think care is very important and I think that we should all do it and we shall uh, do it because we think it is right and good to do it. Um, but care is also its own terrain of uh, subordination and domination. And this is sort of, I think, attenuated in a lot of the legal theory. Like we see particularly Polakoff and Feynman talking about care in these sort of majestic, beautiful, humane terms, as if it's always something that is altruistically, generously given. I mean, sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not, and sometimes it's just work. Um, and so I think Nicole stibner over here who's discussing um, Nancy Fraser uh, is right when she says that we need to also interrogate what care is and what it means and who does it and the, and, and the domination that is um, inherent or, or, or can be um, experienced within the caring relationship. Um, so I think here is where we get to the real family abolitionism that isn't sort of a care fetishism. Um, if we're not romanticizing care and we're thinking about it as work, I think that kind of, maybe that takes us back to compensation a little bit if we think about it as work. But, but I think thinking about it as work means um, that it's, that we don't sort of romanticize the domination that can exist within caring relationships. Um, so for example, there's going to be, um, so Eva Kite, who's sort of a, a feminist philosopher of note, uh, would say that, well, um, romanticizing care and thinking that it's all good means that like the people who are caring are not allowed to really have like negative emotions to, about the work that they're doing. Um, and actually there's, and, and, and if we, if we move away from that, then we can say, well, actually sometimes care is bad and sometimes care sucks to, to do, um, but that's like, okay. And that's just something that is a fact. Um, and that doesn't make the care a bad person or the cared for person a bad person. It just is uh, an inequality of provision of care that, that is irremediable, right? Um, so with this in mind, uh, what are the kind of, what do we do with all of this, right? I think um, in recent years, there's been an upswing in interest in family abolition. We've seen a lot of um, feminist and Marxist feminist theorists talk about family abolition in new terms and try to revive the idea um, for a sort of post-pandemic uh, end times kind of world. And I think particularly during the pandemic, we had a lot of people talking about care and caring for others and like, okay, yes, but is caring for, is my boss telling me to care for myself, like actually really caring? I don't, I'm not sure. Um, and so I think we need to take back a little bit of, of, of care from, from people who would sort of have it be like a palliative thing that is kind of, okay, this is great. We all love each other. And this is, you know, joyous, happy rainbows. Um, and I think we need to, to take it back to the materialist route a little bit and say, actually taking care seriously means uh, radically reorganizing society. Um, and, and it's not sort of a backward movement of sort of, let's go back, skip whatever capitalism did to us that was awful, and like exist in a pre-capitalist kind of utopia, 
that's that's not that's not what I think is the answer that we should come to. Um, but in trying to brainstorm this reorganization, I'm struck that I think a lot of us would be tempted to place the responsibility back on the state. And you think, okay, well, we can abolish marriage um, and, and the legal family, um, but if we just had better social supports, then it should be fine. And this is the argument that uh, the people like Margot Young and, and Al Stott, who's sort of famous for the stakes theory, uh, which we can talk about later too, which I have thoughts about. Um, so they would say, yeah, we just need like a, a, a like a Keynesian welfare state on max power. Like we need to, this is this is what needs to happen. Um, but I think if we're really to take the the Marxist intervention seriously here, I think we I think feminists and queer legal theorists say, no, we can do a little bit better than that. We can do much better than that. Um, we can do we can do mutual aid, we can do non-state provision of these goods. And we can create um, communal and collective living arrangements that bypass the state because we know, um, as Weeks said, that we don't really like the state because the state is doing these things to us and subordinating us in, in, in ways that are unacceptable. Um, but we can do something else amongst ourselves. Um, and so I think, that's, I think that's where we need to land. And I think that for legal theorists who are interested in, in this kind of political commitment, um, removing the formal relationship status in law, so marriage and then, and then in, in, in places like Ontario, cohabitation, and instead dispersing all the rights and responsibilities that attach to those things to caring relationships instead is one way to sort of bypass the state from this part of the equation. Um, so I'll sort of briefly finish with a, a few reflections on what I on on kind of yeah how proto family abolitionism can can ditch the proto and get to family abolition. Um, I think this is this sort of uh, provocation or, or sort of challenge that I'm making to a lot of the legal theory is one that is um, echoed by a lot of other legal theorists of, of a sort of um, uh, of a materialist bent. Um, who are concerned with how the law affects marginalized groups and people particularly who are economically marginalized. Um, and so I think uh, more concrete engagement with, with people who are poor, people who use social assistance is, is really essential to creating um, a legal theory that can do the work of bringing us to family abolition. Um, so for example, I'm thinking about a lot of um, feminist scholarship um, on single mothers and being poor and using welfare. But that's never really connected to um, the law, and I think that's like a, a really inter important intervention that needs to be made that hasn't been yet. Um, and I think also that um, yeah, taking the material preconditions that 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 need to be met before family life at all and life at all really can be can be had is is the starting. Um, I'll finish there, and then we'll do questions later. Yeah, it's great. Thank you.